Our next talk is going to be analyzing the looping mechanisms with Python lists by Saeed Ansab Wakar Gilani and Saeed Muhammad Dawood Shiraz Ali. Saeed Ansab is a software engineer passionate for architectures, design patterns. Uh, Saeed Ansab loves optimizing products and making engineering and processing easy, smooth, and fast. He has an immense amount of experience working as an engineer and orchestrating architectures for startups and matured products. And Saeed Muhammad is a tech nerd navigating the space in search of a purpose. Please welcome them. Uh, I am Saeed Muhammad Daud from Lahore, Pakistan. And I'm really excited to present to you analyzing the looping mechanism in Python list here at PyCascades 2023. Uh, my co-speaker here is Sayed Ansab Kedani. A bit about ourselves. Uh, I've been working as a software engineer at RBSoft, which is an IT company at Lahore, Pakistan. Ansab used to work at RBSoft as well, but he recently moved to Bangkok, Thailand, and he's now working as a software engineer at Agoda. If you want to get in touch with either of us or just want to connect with us, here are QR codes to our LinkedIn profiles. That said, what is our agenda for today? Uh, so we just want to discuss about the different looping mechanism that we have in Python, try to understand the reasoning behind having different loops and what would be the best use case for each looping mechanism that we have in there. Before we jump into the different loops that we have, uh, a bit introduction about iterators or iFrico. So the idea behind looping is that we'll have a collection of items and we want to access each and every item in that collection. That collection can be contiguous and stored in memory altogether, like a sequence, or the, thus uh, the collection can be, each value of any collection can be get on need by basis uh, in the form of generator. So the idea again here is that uh, we have a collection of items. They can be in memory or they can the, their values can be yielded, but the idea is that we'll have different type of looping mechanism and each looping mechanism might fit either sequence or generator depending upon the use case here. What are the different groups uh, that we'll be taking a look at today? So these are the six major categories that we'll be uh, looking into. Starting with the traditional for in iterable loops. I think this is the first loop that we encounter when we start working with Python is that we have a uh, collection uh, or a list and we just want to traverse over each element. We don't care about the length of list or the index, we just want to access each element and perform some sort of operation. That operation can simply be reading its value or performing some operation and getting an value. We are only concerned with getting the each value in that list. On the right side, you will be seeing the decoupled uh, version of the same code. Uh, we won't be looking into the like the details of that, but uh, the idea of placing this decompiled version alongside each loop is that on the back end, there will be different operations happening for each loop. And that different operation on the back end plays a great and important role in determining the performance of the, that looping mechanism. So you, you'll be seeing this for the other looping mechanism types as well. Jumping into the next category, which is range, uh, it is pretty much similar to for in, uh, but previously we were looping over the elements of the list. In here, we are iterating over a range object. The range object because it's an iterator, we can like loop over its values and uh, get those values in, in the form of an index. Uh, we can define like where we start a range, where we'll end it, what will be the jumping there. So it is pretty much similar to for in, in that regard, but where we were iterating over list element, here we are iterating over the range values. Enumerate is, yeah, you can say that a bit of combination of both, where we are interested in the index of the value and the value itself. So uh, we another way to do this would have been that we define a counter starting from zero and then iterate over the 
uh, length of list and based upon the index, we get the value that is present at, at that index. But uh, Python has a built-in method where we can get both index and value at the same time by, by using enumerate method. And you can see on the left side that the decompiled version there is uh, extra processing there going on. So it might be a simple thing, but on the on the back end, or at least on the machine level, there, there is additional things happening uh, for this. I think list comprehension is something that we have all used and sort of proud to be a Pythonic uh, way to do uh, a lot of stuff with list comprehension. Uh, but the catch here is that uh, where the previous looping mechanisms we were just iterating over the elements, the output of list comprehension is that there will always be a new list. So that is why you would see that this comprehension is used a lot for the filtration or, or mapping of data purposes. So we just want to, uh, let's say in list of integer, we want to uh, determine the power of two of each or so simple stuff like that. With list comprehension, we will be getting a new uh, sequence at the end. And that is pretty much a cache here with previous looping mechanism that we have seen. There won't be a new uh, sequence return. We can create a new sequence in, in those loads, but that would be optional. But here, uh, it is like the output of what uh, we are doing. While loop uh, is also a bit different from other looping me mechanism where uh, in previous uh, looping mechanism, we had an idea of like how much we will be iterating over. So if we had a list, we knew that it will be the length of list. Or if we defined a range, we had the idea of like what will be the length of that range. In while loop, we are uh, basically bridging our iteration over a condition like or expression. So until that expression is fulfilled, we'll, we'll keep doing that operation. So for instance, searching, so I think it's a good, until we don't find a value in the list, we'll just keep on looking over each element of the list. We could do these things in other loops as well, but it's about the intent. Uh, for, for or foreign loops are like, they are to traverse each element, but for a while, we might not be traversing the each element of the list. We just want to do, we just want to do the iteration until a certain condition is met. The zip method is like the outliers of all things here because we are traversing or traversing our two lists, two or more lists at the same time. And that is like a pre precondition here. We might be traversing, uh, the idea is that we have two lists, we want to traverse uh, them together. It depends upon the use cases, like why do we want to do that. So for instance, this uh, particular method is used a lot in programming and coding computation to get a dict value given a two byte paper. So again, it is like specific to use case, but on the on the back end side, you can see that the operations here are have operational capacity here is a lot. So oh, we touch a bit into the different uh, looping styles. What is the impact of runtime? on choosing each style. At this point, I'll hand over the mic to Unsep to uh, get you the details of that. And at the end, we'll discuss the use cases of where we should use each looping mechanism. Thank you, Daud. Uh, as Daud said, I'll be talking about the analysis uh, that we did on different runtimes between different loops uh, in Python. So a little bit disclaimer before I actually talk about the analysis, the time complexities, the trends. Um, here is a sample loop that we uh, created for this particular mechanism. For this particular research, we used a search key loop, uh, which essentially searches indexes for a key given in any list and return that as a list in, in to the user, right? So this is a sample function and you can see if um, it, it's a simple function. We have two parameters, nums and keys, and we, check if the key is uh, present in any of the index of num and we add that into the into a new array of indexes that we have created and we return the indexes as a list to the user 
um a little bit disclaimers about all of this executions and time complexities uh all loops are executed with similar logic we try to minimize any additional logic so uh there's like no bias for run times there's no bias for additional um usage that we are going to use and uh, yeah the results are pretty similar and i think uh when you scale them up in real-time environments they're going to be very much similar for you guys Secondly, uh, all inputs are randomly generated. So we try to recreate a typical real world scenario um, in, in our research. So there's like no best case, worst case scenario in this. We just use randomly generated inputs. We don't even know what th those inputs were. And we try to execute all of those inputs on each every, on like all of the loops. So there's no bias, like for example, uh, a particular loop, for example, enumerate is executing um, a list that is that has a lot of keys uh, as compared to uh, range four, which has no keys, right? So we used every input on all of the loops. And lastly, all looping timings uh, that are mentioned from now on are average runtimes uh, for each loop. And we calculated all of these average timings uh, based on 100 iterations for each particular input size. So, um, Let's move ahead and we'll talk about how actually uh, these loops are scaled uh, in, in the runtime. So here is an example. We ran uh, a sample test size of hundreds of list size, right? We executed 10 uh, inputs and then 50 and then 100. And over here, you can see that the graph has a good um, overview of how uh, it's performing in different environments. So we have the while loop on the first and we, as you can see, it has the most a significant amount of runtimes that we have executed. After that, we have enumerate, which is moderately less. Uh, we have foreign iterables. Now, this particular iterable, uh, this particular loop is kind of standing out. What I mean by that is uh, for larger inputs, you can see that it has significantly a steeper curve as compared to a moderate curve for medium size inputs. And for smaller inputs, it has a very small uh, runtime, right? So essentially, that is the entire argument that all of these loops are a bit flaky when they perform. And as the inputs scale up, the complexity between the loops also scale up. Furthermore, when you look at the range for loops, you can see that the curves are uh, pretty much similar, right? Uh, the steeps, uh, like the slopes that we see are not that way uh, steep as compared to other uh, inputs. And lastly, uh, for list comprehension and zip methods, you can see that zip methods have a lot of complexity, a lot of uh, calculations that go on behind the scenes, as Dao mentioned earlier. And that's why it's it's a bit complicated and big time consuming. On the other hand, uh, the list comprehension is, uh, <clears throat> it, it's a moderate size of, uh, of, of looping mechanisms. Uh, so essentially that is the whole trend that we carry forward. When we scale up, uh, all of these uh, trends become much more apparent, much more similar, um, and much more consistent. So you can see that the while loop has the most time consuming complexity, uh, followed by enumerate, which has the lowest, uh, time consuming complexity. Now it's a fair comparison between, um, arranged for loops or a foreign lo uh, loop, uh, as compared to enumerate. And as Daud mentioned earlier, it's the functional programming, uh, in Python that has been optimized over the years, over the last, uh, couple of years, especially uh, when the uh, Python 3 was emerging. And uh, yeah, the uh, functional programming has obviously made Python a lot more easier and a lot more uh, powerful uh, when working with large data sets. Uh, on the other hand, you can see that uh, zip methods uh, are obviously like uh, taking a lot of time. Uh, but in, in its defense, I would say that zip methods offer a lot of more functionality as compared to other loops. Right, so it's it's doing um, the mechanism for two loops that uh, the other loops are doing in one iteration. Lastly, if we scale all of this uh, in in larger environments, in larger sample size, as compared like something that is very much available in data science, right? Uh, we would see that most of the loops, especially the while loops, are a lot more uh, time consuming and a lot less efficient as compared to other loops. Um, there is enumerate method, which is so showing similar kind of consistencies as before. Um, we have our foreign in iterable, which is also pretty much similar to what we see, but what we saw in the previous slide. 
Um, the range for loop is also pretty much consistent and as well as less comprehension. But on the other hand, zip method and while loop are both of them are um, a lot less efficient as compared to um, the other loops. And we can see the slopes on these ends, which are uh, uh, describing a higher input size, uh, 300, 3 million uh, input size to be precise. And yes, so this steep slope is essentially the thing that you need to consider uh, before executing any loop. So what do we understand from all of that? We have understood that different time loops have different uh, runtime complexities. We saw what happens behind the scenes. So what exactly are we going to use in our day-to-day -day use cases? What loops should we use and when? That's what I'm going to talk about next. <clears throat> Ideally, each loop is executed with a specific data structure. Each uh, use case is dependent on a data structure that is particular for each application. So for example, in list, we have list comprehensions, we have ranged and for loops, we have enumerate, and lastly, for while. We'll talk, even though like the while uh, is a little bit less um, efficient as, as compared to other loops, we will talk about why the while loop is so much used uh, in the modern day programming. Then we have our dictionaries. Um, obviously, we have the list and dictionary comprehensions available for the text. Uh, then we have foreign loops uh, that we can use uh, for dictionaries. Then, of course, the zip loop is very much uh, usable for dictionaries because, again, you have that anomaly of keys and values that uh, you essentially need to uh, map with each other. And lastly, for while loop is also very much uh, popular with dictionaries. Uh, dictionaries. And then lastly, we have graph data uh, structures, which is like a custom data structure available in Python. Uh, we have foreign loops that we uh, mostly use in graphs. Uh, and then there is like the while loop uh, that we use in modern day graph algorithms. So about the use cases, this is, uh, I'll move this a bit. So uh, talking about the use cases, right? Uh, how loops are specific to particular use cases. Now we don't actually use all of the loops for all of the use cases. So for example, um, you're not uh, encouraged to use for loops or for in loops to create a data structure, right? You can just do that for uh, with the use of list comprehensions, right? Uh, you can read the data, uh, which is a very large set of data, um, and you want to uh, create a dedication uh, association between uh, the data and its indexes. You would be encouraged to use enumerate. So, what exactly use? What exact are those use cases? We'll talk about it in this slide. So, first of all, multiple looping conditions. This is where the while loop comes in. We talk, I was mentioning a little bit earlier that uh, the while loop is going to be used a lot in uh, loops, in in looping mechanisms in inside list. So, this is the particular use case the while is famous for. Now, uh, most of the uh, most of the loops that we use in, in other uh, mechanisms, we see that um, most of them are executing from the start to end without any terminating, uh, you know, logic uh, for for that loop. In while loop, what we do is we have either custom made, um, you know, um, conditions uh, that is going to break the loop, or we have multiple uh, looping conditions that is going to break the loop, and essentially that defines the whole idea of using while. That's why while is so much popular in the modern day programming. Then we have creation. Like I was mentioning, list comprehension has a good reputation for its extraordinary reading and uh, optimizing capabilities. It's it's very much readable for any of the engineer out there. So it's very much popular among mod in, in modern day programming, especially in um, the programming that we use, uh, functional programming, that is. Um, the third is multiple iterables. Uh, now we have a uh, multiple sort of uh, list, or maybe let's say we are using binary um, search in, in, in a particular context. Uh, zip methods are very much effective as they uh, provide the iterations that we are going to use in a particular list. And we can create two uh, smaller lists and execute um, any particular uh, algorithm on those smaller lists. Similarly, uh, we have multiple lists, multiple iterables. Uh, we can use a zip method to iterate over all of those. So ideally, we uh, destroy the whole concept of nested loops 
and we use parallel programming, parallel executions in in uh, in different iterables. So that is the power of zip methods. Lastly, we have data index associations. Like I was mentioning earlier, enumerate methods are essentially what is used to dedicate uh, an index to its uh, data uh, rather than using two loops. Like for example, if you're using for in loop uh, or using for in range loop, uh, you would expect to um, read the data at the same time as uh, getting its index. For enumerate, you would be getting the index and the value at the same time. And you won't use any extra uh, method to uh, like ex extra memory call to get the value out of the uh, memory. So that is the power of enumerate. Fifth, uh, we have data parsing. Now, uh, in in modern day programming, we have data science, we have data engineering, and we have these large data sets, right? Um, so. Essentially, uh, with the time complexities, we have some sort of certain uh, time and memory um, problems as well. So we are sometimes limited on memory executions, memory um, power, memory size. Uh, so what data uh, parsing essentially means is uh, whenever like we're using foreign or range loops, we are not required to create a new list. Essentially, we are getting the elements from a particular list where executing some sort of algorithm on that particular um, element and essentially read, just writing that on, on that memory location. We don't need to uh, create a new list. We don't need to make multiple copies. And that is the power of data parsing in um, the foreign and range loops. That's why they're there. And lastly, uh, we have lazy content parsing, which is also very much powerful. Um, so I'm an engineer um, in, in who has uh, worked a lot with Django and Python. And we use generators as a staple uh, in reading large content at the same time. So essentially what generators does is um, they execute for a particular value. And rather than going to the next value, uh, essentially they use a lazy fashion um, that essentially executes those the other uh, values when they're required, rather than executing all of all the data, all um, the algorithm on, on all of the list, uh, rather than waiting for all of that, we are just executing that for the required element and then doing the next execution on the next element when it's required rather than uh, just reading its values. So it's very much powerful and very much usable in, in the real time context. Yes, so that brings us to our end. Um, here are the bunch of references. Uh, that you can go through that we used to uh, make all of these slides. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll move to the QA uh, section and you can ask any uh, question to me and Dal. Thanks, guys.